Hey guys and welcome to PokerStrategy.com My name is Boomer and today I'll be starting a small series where I look into some of the hands that have been submitted to our hand judging forum on PokerStrategy.com For those of you that are unfamiliar with the hand judging forums if you click on the forum link and scroll down to the Limit Hold'em forums you'll see several forums where you can submit your hands from pretty much any level for review by our selected panel of volunteer and professional hand judges. This pretty much means that any hand you submit will be looked at by either a coach or a professional hand reviewer and you'll get hopefully the high quality analysis that you're looking for. In this video I hope to go into a little bit more detail on some of the hands that I have judged at the silver level stake, so we're dealing with 0.51 and 1, 2. And what I also hope to do is um, try and get some more people on board to the idea of this hand judging level. This, we're always looking for more and more hands to be submitted to this area. It's a great way to examine new concepts. If you're having trouble with a hand, it's an awesome way of getting feedback on it whether you're making a mistake in an area or whether you're making a uh, sort of mental error not quite understanding a concept there's always going to be someone there to answer your questions for you so without further ado we're going to move on to the hands in question I've got six hands for you today um, I will show you the hand histories first and then we'll go through them in the replay in more depth and I hope you enjoy it In this first hand, submitted by user Madorgian, we have 6-5 suited in the cutoff and we've got a massive multi-way pot. You mentioned that this hand caused a bit of an argument in the Hungarian forums and with a little bit of a sense of mischief I hope to turn that into a pretty big argument overall. Um, and hopefully come up with some interesting things for you guys to ponder. Okay, so in this hand, the undergun player opens, hijack calls, and we reach our first decision point of the hand. Personally, at this point, I would fold the hand for a couple of reasons. Number one, we're not on the button. So therefore, we can't guarantee that we're going to be able to play this hand in position. We might sucker the button in with a call, but it's kind of unlikely in this situation and I would really want to guarantee that I'm going to get a four-way pot to play 6-5 suited here to be honest I probably want a five-way pot um, the small blind is weak tight so it's unlikely he's gonna come in and the big blind is unknown but he can be dealt trash like anyone else if I was on the button I would probably call call say 8-9 suited and above in this situation uh, the reason for this being that if you flop a pair with 8-9 uh, you're a lot more happy with your hand and also um, you make some sort of middle straights and you generally get boards where you can get a lot of action with those sorts of hands. Uh, conversely if I was on the uh, button with a pocket pair and I could guarantee action from the blinds I would actually play any pocket pair in that position. The difference between a pocket pair and a suited connector in this situation is the fact that with a pocket pair, if you hit the flop with a pocket pair, which isn't that much more unlikely than hitting a big draw, you can actually flop 65-70% equity if you flop a set in the pot, and that's in a multi-way pot. Whereas with a suited connector, it's very rare you're going to flop above 30-35% equity. So it's just a slight difference that okay maybe it's slightly more unlikely that you're going to flop a set with a pocket pair but the rewards for doing so are far greater than flopping well with a suited connector one thing to note also about 6-5 suited and the reason that I prefer folding it is that you really don't want to be flopping single pair hands with 6-5 suited in multi-way pots you're almost never going to be best 
and because the pot gets to a certain size you're going to end up putting quite a lot of action in with a hand that really doesn't warrant it so it's one of those hands where a small mistake can lead to a big mistake and can cost you quite a bit of money but anyway I wouldn't be selecting this hand if we didn't come along so we do come along and now the small blind three bets this would actually terrify me coming from this player with a raise and two cold calls already I would say his range for doing this is exceedingly narrow um, I think we're talking aces through tens ace king and probably ace queen suited it really is just going to be an incredibly narrow range and just to make things that little bit worse the under the gun player now caps again he looks loose but his preflop raise is actually fairly standard if anything it's pretty low so for him to be capping in this situation he again very tight range range that's probably crushing us overall we've no option but to call here we obviously can't fold so um, we get to see the flop a little side note here about the implied odds of the hand notice that the pot is already seventeen dollars the pots already huge in this situation when the pot is so large preflop implied odds play a lot smaller um, part in determining whether you should play the hand or not because you can't make up for putting four bets in preflop here on a f future street when the pot's as big as it is you tend to scale back more towards equity calculations than implied odds sadly at this point we've got one of the worst flops that we can actually come across that would keep us in the hand we have flopped a pair so we have some equity in the pot but we know that we're up against some very strong ranges here small blind bets out which considering he's betting into the preflop kappa and he took that immensely strong line preflop um, I'm basically putting him on either a monstrous flush draw, sort of ace king of clubs, ace queen of clubs, or he's got pocket jacks, or he's got queens through aces. That's pretty much the uh, hand range you're putting him on. I know it sounds very pessimistic, but you've just got to look at the guy to know he's not messing around here. And now the under the gun player, the preflop kappa raises. This could be a slightly weaker range than the small blind. I could imagine that if he has a hand like pocket tens through pocket nines, that uh, well, even pocket eights, that he uh, would probably raise it here to uh, protect his hand. Um, I think that would be a fairly decent uh, play for him to make. But uh, overall, he's going to be strong. And to be honest, if he does have eights through tens, that's not much better for us because we have a pair of fives. So he's still beating us quite handily even with a pair of eights or tens etc the hijack folds and it's to us and we're getting ten to one so let's have a look at our equity at this point against the ranges that I've already described that's actually quite a lot of equity and if it was just down to the equity we'd snap call here and it wouldn't be close but we have a problem equity at least the way it's calculated at this point assumes that the hand ends immediately or our equity in the pot how it keep if it were to show down right now the problem being it's not going to do that for one thing and we don't close the action the small blind here we've already put on a pretty darn strong range and I think he could very well three bet here if he does three bet our odds continually get worse if he three bets and the under the gun player calls on the flop we've put three dollars into a twenty six dollar pot which would be giving ourselves slightly worse than eight to one odds if the small blind was a three bet and the under the gun player capped we were then looking at a foot putting in four dollars in total into a twenty nine dollar pot which would actually give us odds of only just over six to one 
So we can't just look at the hand and go, oh, we're getting 10 to 1. We need 9.1% equity to continue. We have 16. I can hit call. That's not the way this is going to work. Additionally, we're going to find it almost impossible to realize the entirety of that equity. We could have the best hand. It's very unlikely, but we could have the best hand. We could be up against ace, king of clubs and king, queen of clubs. But if we do have the best hand, we're never going to be able to get the maximum value out of it. If we uh, have the worst hand and just start calling down willy-nilly, we're just going to put a huge amount of money in when we have the worst hand. The hand that we have has a, quite a bit of reverse implied odds. And even though the pot's big already and reverse implied odds aren't really as important as they could be, don't forget that we're not in a position to be able to close the action here, so it's just going to get more and more expensive for us. If these two both have overpairs, I don't expect them to slow down really before the river. And certainly if one of them has a set, he's not slowing down, period. So can we call two just to see if we improve? Again, that's debatable because we're not closing the action. We can improve to um, an outside straight draw on the turn. We can improve to a gut shot on the turn, as well as improving to two pair or trips. But the problem that we have is that how many outs are we going to give ourselves, first of all? We've got five outs to two pair or trips. The problem with that being that our outs aren't 100% clean. If we're against a jack, then our 5 is useless. And so is our 6, in fact, if we're up against a jack. We basically have to go runner-runner if we're up against pocket jack. So we're pretty much dead. If we're up against two over pairs, i.e. a hand like ace-jack and another one like pocket 10s, etc., we do go ahead if we hit our six on the turn, but even if we do hit two pair on the if we hit two pair on the turn, an over pair or a hand like ace jack actually have an awful lot of outs to beat us. If the seven pairs, if the jack pairs, if they hit their kicker, if they hit their own if they hit their set, etc. So any hand, even if we hit two pair, pretty much any hand they're representing is gonna have at least eight outs against us. And if they've got a big flush draw, they're obviously going to have their nine outs against us as well. So we can't ever be in a position where even if we improve, we have them drawing pretty close to dead. If we hit our five, one of our two fives, then that's slightly different because then that reduces them to their set outs. So we have to diminish our outs somewhat for that. Our backdoor straight draw is worth somewhere around probably 0.75 outs given the fact there's a flush draw on the board and it is actually possible. So all in all I would probably give us about four outs to improve. Um, just overall because of the fact that we have some reverse implied odds with our hand and not all of our outs are clean. So again getting 10 to 1 we could peel for four outs, but that would be assuming that the small blind promises us he's never going to three bet. I would say that that's far too razor thin. And in this situation, I would want us to fold. In our second hand, submitted by user San Momo, we dealt pocket sixes and it's a fairly standard three bet situation except in this situation we've got a really big fish in the big blind and uh, he wants to know how he thinks that we should play this post flop. So now onto this hand with pocket sixes. Button opens, he's fairly loose passive, um, 60-13, pretty perfect guy to have position on, so I congratulate San Momo on his uh, game selection here. Good 3-bet with 6s, this is very standard, um, 
the big blind takes two cold. Uh, he's an eighty VPIP guy, so we've got to assume he's going to do that. To be honest, in this situation, if say the cutoff had raised and the button had cold called, I would cold call sixes here. Uh, it's pretty obvious that the big blind is going to come along with pretty much any two, so I think this would be a good position to cold call him. Um, but I think the three bet here is fine. It's uh, probably neither here nor there. You could cold call, but I think that gaining the initiative with sixes is fine. Come to the flop, King Jack three. It's a good flop to represent for a pre-flop three better certainly. So we lead. Small blind calls and the button calls. Not particularly brilliant. We'd like to have got rid of one of them, but it doesn't mean that either of them's got a king or jack. The button has a 0.7% aggression factor, which for someone who has a 60% VPIP, it's not actually that low. Um, I'd probably equate that to an aggression factor of sort of 1.2 somewhere around there for someone who's got a decent uh, VPIP but uh, you know he's certainly not incapable of betting or raising so um, he may have a uh, he may have a draw of some description he may have a hand like Queen 9 he may have two diamonds he may have a three um, there's plenty of hands here that we still have value against I'm quite happy uh, in our situation I'm not ready to give up yet I want to see what happens on the turn the turn's another jack, and that's pretty good for our hand, really. If no one was paired on the flop, they're obviously still unpaired. And uh, we may even get some folds out of hands like sevens at this point, although I think that's going to be very rare. So, I think Sam Momo does the right thing here, and he barrels the turn. I think that's very good. I, uh, I would be bet folding in this circumstance. I honestly don't think we're going to get bluffed here pretty much ever. Uh, I think that it's a uh, good situation for us. If we were up against a more loose aggressive player in uh, either position, then a raise here might put us, uh, might make us a little bit uncomfortable, but we may have to uh, just call down in that circumstance because he could be either free showdown raising or he could be bluffing, trying to get us to fold, etc. But in this situation, I'd be a lot happier folding. Small blind, sorry, big blind calls, and the button folds. So, but at least we got rid of one of them. If the river comes as a brick here, say a four, a five, a deuce, maybe even a seven or eight, I would actually look to put in a value bet here against a hand like Ace High. Um, I think or a three, etc. I think that. Uh, we probably have enough to stick a value bet in here if the river does completely brick off. Unfortunately the river doesn't brick off, that's about as bad as it gets. Uh, obviously any two Broadway cards now beating us, you don't have to have two Broadway cards, but uh, you know, any sort of gut shot hand like Queen 9, uh, you know, Queen 10 if it was a straight draw etc has got there. Um, the pot at this point it's eight big bets, but I really don't see a way for us to win this hand now. Um, turning our pair into a bluff doesn't really work because he's not folding a king ever. He's not folding a queen. Uh, to be honest, getting him to fold tens through nines, through eights, through sevens, I don't think that's a big enough part of his range for it to work. And I don't think he's bluffing often enough for us to pick off a bluff here because if you look, he's a very passive player. I think if he has a three here, he's probably going to check it, uh, check it behind. So in this situation, my preferred play is actually to check fold with sixes. It sucks, but uh, a lot of the time in our three betting range, we are actually going to hit this board quite a lot. So. Uh, I'm not too unhappy against someone like this of just check folding, but uh, unfortunately our hero does check call in this situation. I think the check's fine, but uh, once you do check, I think check folding on this river is very standard. There's just nowhere near enough hands that we beat here, and I don't think he's turning a hand into a bluff often enough for us to be good.
Moving on to the third hand, we have cash from EBG. And he open raises a one gap suited connector in the cutoff, only to be three bet by the big blind. We flop a pair, and his question is how to proceed from here. This will illustrate some fairly interesting concepts, sort of where we should be raising with pairs, how to examine our opponent's range, etc. So we move into the replayer. I think this is a pretty decent open 7-9 suited. It's pretty much at the bottom of uh, what would be my cutoff range, but I don't think that it's uh, too loosey goosey. Um, I think that it's a, a decent open. I'd certainly open 10 8 suited from the cutoff. Um, depending on the button, if the button's an empty chair, then I think that this is absolutely fine. Big blind 3 bets, and we take a flop. Flop comes fairly decently for us, it's king 9 3. So let's examine some equities here. I've given the big blind a fairly standard 3 betting range, and this might surprise you, but we're actually behind that range. Um, the fact really becomes that he's going to have a lot of Broadway hands and a lot of pairs in his range. So we're not doing very well against that sort of range. He may occasionally have a hand like Jack-10, 9-10 suited, etc. in his range. But to be honest, we're not doing that well against Jack-10 or 9-10 suited. 10-9, sorry, Jack-10 suited has a gut shot, um, plus two over cards to us, and 9-10 suited obviously has a beat, so that doesn't make things any better for us. And uh, so I actually like Cash from E's play here, which is the big blind leads out and cash from me just calls. I think in this situation I would probably be looking towards getting to showdown. Against certain players I might just call call and then fold the river. Uh, versus very standard tags who pretty much would always check with a hand like ace high. If they go bet 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 in rapid fire here having three bet pre flop you can almost always put them on an over pair or a king but uh, against most players in today's games where um, a lot more aggressive you might just have to grit your teeth and call down at this point but uh, I like uh, Cash from his decision here not to put a raise in on the uh, flop. The turn's awesome for us and now if we look at our equity yeah that's pretty much what we were expecting here um, he asks in his th um, thread where there's any merit to just calling and hoping to pick up another bet from a hand like ace high on the river. I honestly don't think so and I also think that you're pr you could end up losing your market. Um, you may occasionally get a spew bet on the uh, term with, from someone with ace king etc. Figure it, especially if you're a fan of waiting for the turn. Uh, with a hand like King Jack King Ten here, you might actually get excess action from uh, Ace King. But the other thing is, if he does have Ace High, I wouldn't expect most tags to uh, bluff the river with Ace High. They check and probably call. Um, so by waiting, you can actually do yourself some real damage here. You have 95% equity against his perceived range any hand that is in his range you know for every bet that goes in you're going to be getting 1.9 bets back so you really really in this situation do not want to open up the possibility of your opponent not giving you three bets here in our fourth hand submitted by Atchill we've got pocket eights and it's a multi-way part his question is, should we be three betting this pre-flop? And I'll try and answer that as best I can, and how it relates to how we can play the hand post-flop. We're moving on to some multi-way blind action here. The undergun player limps, and he's a really loose aggressive player. Very showdown bound as well. 
Uh, for what it's worth, I've given him this range. Um, it's a fairly large range, but uh, I've taken out some of the more uh, hand, some of the more um, value-orientated hands, which I think he would probably uh, have raised with pre-flop. And I think this is pretty good for uh, what we think he probably has. And then weak player limps along. Now, the thing is, this guy is very passive, obviously, but if you look, his VPIP is only 33. So, he's going to have a very similar range to a tight aggressive player. It's just that uh, he's forgotten where his raise button is, essentially. Uh, you just have to be very careful of guys like these, that you don't treat them as loose passive players and start isolating them all over the place. Their limps deserve as much respect as a raise would out of some players, uh, especially if this uh, read is over a large quantity of hands. A loose passive player then bumps it up on the button. And now it's to us. In a lot of situations like this, I do like 3-betting. For the simple fact that uh, if we manage to push out the two limpers by forcing them to call two call, that's a massive victory for us and we get to take the uh, initiative here. In this situation I'm not sure I'm a monstrous fan of it. First let's have a look at some equities. So we're not actually, we certainly don't have enough equity overall to be three betting. But there is another thing. The raise came from the button. If it had come from the small blind and we could actually potentially buy position, I would be a lot more in favour of 3-betting. But combined with the fact that it's come from such a passive player, this raise, and we have another passive player with a tight range in the pot already, our pocket H could actually be in an awful lot more trouble than we're giving him credit for. So in this situation, I would probably prefer a call. But I can understand Atchell's reasons here, and I certainly am not going to sort of bag on him too much for 3-betting here. But I think given this configuration of players, I actually prefer a call to a 3-bet. I think a hand like 10s is too much not to 3-bet. 9s is right on the borderline, and given how uh, passive the button is, I would probably just call that hand as well. Also, the other thing to note is that the undergun has pretty much a 100% VPIP, so he's going absolutely nowhere, and so we're relying an awful lot on our 33 naught friend in the hijack to fold. And given the fact that the pot's going to be bigger by the time it gets to him, I think it's going to be uh, pretty unlikely he's going to let go of a hand as well. The other downside of 3-betting is that we can occasionally get flops like this. If we just look at our equity again, uh, revalue for this flop, it's pretty horrendous. Um, remember to break even we need 25% equity on this flop. So we're looking for an awful lot of fold equity here which I just don't think that we have. Um, to be honest, I think the best play here would probably be to check fold with eights. Um, firing a continuation bet here, alright it's fairly standard but what are you really hoping to happen? You're gonna get three folds pretty much never. Um, I'd say you're very unlikely to get two folds. You might get one but that really doesn't do you any good because you're probably still crushed. Um, sure you're getting 12.5 to 1 on your bet but if it never works it might as well no it might as well be 50 to 1 if it never works um, so in this situation I think check fold is probably the best play but um, I can certainly understand firing a continuation bet out there the one thing that you do have to um, understand, certainly in multi-way parts, is that continuation bets are not a necessity. In heads-up parts, 
sure, you pretty much bet 100% of the time um, because you're getting 4.5 to 1 to um, take a shot at the pot um, on most occasions and your opponent could just have nothing and fold. So it's almost always a profitable bet when you're playing heads up. And even three-way, it's almost always profitable to continuation bet. But once you go beyond um, three-way play, you really don't want to be... Um, just continuation betting all the time when it's hopeless. But actual does fire out the continuation bet and as predicted every single player at the table calls. So now there's just no choice whatsoever in what we do, we just shut down. Especially when a card that bad comes on the turn. So just shut down. It does get checked through which surprises me a bit. I think that uh, the button could have a hand like nines here potentially. He may have something like ace nine, ace ten as well. But uh, I'm obviously a little bit, uh, <laughs> a little bit confused about what he can have. The river's a six. We obviously just beat absolutely nothing. So again, just check and fold. It is tempting to look this guy up here, but uh, if you think about it, we beat seven eight and uh, that's pretty much it really we beat 7-8 so uh, and we hold 2-8 just to make things that little bit worse so yeah folding is the uh, correct move here moving forward to another hand submitted by actual this time we've got ace 10 off and this is fairly interesting as it's a hand which demonstrates a lot the fact that while we may have showdown value with our hand it might not be the best idea to be calling down and it's how we can examine our opponent's range to give us the best clues about whether we should be calling down so we've got ace 10 in the hijack here till opens this is a very standard open cut off folds button folds small blind folds and now a player who looks from his preflop stats at least to be a um, tight aggressive player pretty much three bets from the big blind the one thing to notice is that his aggression factor is exceedingly high and his um, when to showdown is exceedingly low this could mean a couple of things one it could mean he's folding too much post flop um, which is a bit unlikely from a player like this and the other thing it could be he just bet bet bets post flop so it's a little high but again you have to look at sample size and uh, various other things but just keep in mind that that aggression factor is exceedingly high Capping, I think, is a bad idea at this point. We've opened raised from a hijack, and someone who should be positionally aware is three betters. So I think he's got a pretty uh, narrow range for doing that. The flop's queen, three, queen. We do have the backdoor nut flush draw. And our opponent bets at us. We're getting seven and a half to one. So let's just have a look at our equities quickly. That's not brilliant. Um, this is actually lower than I thought it would be when I first stoved it but the problem is that our ace is very often dominated and that could actually really hurt us when it comes down to the uh, comes down to the final hands if he has ace high he's more than likely ahead um, sure we beat king high but we lose to all pairs and all other ace highs at this point so even though we are probably looking at getting two showdown at this point um, we're certainly not fist pumping about the idea we're certainly obviously not folding but uh, on the flop at least but uh, it's just to drum in that this isn't exactly a fist pump uh, when this flop comes down turn comes and it's the eight of spades this changes pretty much nothing um, our equity drops to around about 25 between 20 and 25 percent at this point but again not a huge amount of change if we were ahead we are still ahead so we're just making a decision at this point 
we're getting five and a bit to one. So at this point we've got to decide are there any rivers that we're going to fold. We're obviously going to call a ten. And to be honest, we probably don't want to raise an ace because getting three bet there just means that we're pretty much beaten always. Um but are there any cards that we're folding? It's very standard thinking and it's also not very good thinking to uh, basically try and shorten the thought process to I have showdown value I should call down. In this situation I don't expect our opponent here to miss a value bet with anything. Uh, he may miss a value bet with ace high but uh, to be honest, given his high aggression factor, he might just bet with it anyway. And in this situation, he would be doing it correctly. So it might be something to look into yourself. If you get a board like this and you have a hand like Ace-King, go for a value bet. It's The guy's probably going to call you down with Ace-High anyway, uh, assuming the river bricks off. So uh, you might be looking at uh, maybe earning a little bit of an extra bet there if you do uh, put a value bet in especially if he doesn't raise you at any point in the hand. So, we call the turn, and now we've got to think about what we're doing on the river. The river comes and it's pretty awful. Um, we now have to think very much about what we beat in this situation. So, if we look at Equilator, we beat nothing. We beat we beat King Jack and King Ten. That's all we beat, and we don't beat King Jack and King Ten of clubs. So the number of combos of hands that we beat are just nothing. A hand looks all right. I get it's ace high. Ace high is supposed to be a decent hand, but the board has come so badly from that Queen Queen Three flop. At this point, we just have no equity if our opponent bets. And he does bet. And in the hand, actual did pay off. And I actually think that that payoff is pretty much... Well, as Equilator shows here, paying off there is a 0.9 big bet mistake. And you really have to be thinking about the hands that you want to be uh, showing down in this situation and uh, even getting seven to one so this is just an example of where just because a flop come has come really well for us and we're looking for showdown we need to be able to change our mind on um, turns and rivers that really hurt our equity in the hand And now moving on to our final hand, we have Cash for Me BG again. And he has King Jack and defends his big blind and wants to know whether turning his hand into a bluff on the turn is a good idea. So we have King Jack off in the big blind. A very tight player opens on the button and I think calling here is fine. Um, occasionally I might want a three better hand like this from the uh, big blind but I think that in this situation as a tight player we run the risk of uh, dominating hands being a much bigger part of his range than normal. Flop comes 9-7 deuce with two diamonds on it. We've flopped an over, two over cards and a backdoor flush draw. Uh, I think peeling one off here is fine. I'd much prefer if we had the king of diamonds but you can't have everything. Uh, I think that uh, our hand's pretty good here. The turn's where things get interesting. It's the seven of diamonds. We've picked up our jack high flush draw. Um, our opponent bets. And now cash for me check raises. I really don't like this check raise. Um, there are a couple of reasons for it. You're specifically targeting ace high here. But the problem being that you're not really representing a huge amount. Um, what you're trying to tell your opponent here is, I've delayed raise with a 9, 
or I peeled with a seven and now I've caught trips or I have a flush. A lot of the times if you take your entire range into uh, consideration for a concept a lot of it doesn't add up. I would imagine most players, I don't know if Kashmir is one of them, but I imagine that most players would be raising pairs and draws on this sort of flop. Um, occasionally they would peel with say a low pair or a middle pair with a low kicker or uh, over cards etc. That's kind of what I'd expect a player to be doing here. So sure we may have a hand like 5, 7 or something like that but to be honest we might even raise that on this flop uh, just because our opponent's range is so weighted towards ace high and sort of pair hands that there's a lot of value to be had from raising. So to be honest we're not really doing a whole lot of representation on the turn. So, even if we were representing perfectly here, asking your opponent to fold an ace high on a paired, on a paired drawn up to hell board is asking an awful lot, even out of someone who has a 35% went to showdown. The other problem that you've got here is that you're not folding out the ace of diamonds. Um, so that eliminates a quarter of the combinations of ace high right away that are going to fold to you. And then if it comes to the river and it bricks off, the guy who has the ace of diamonds is probably going to go, well, all the draws brick, so I'm going to call anyway, and you're going to end up looking really bad. And I don't think he's going to fold any big ace. I like ace 10 plus. So really you're targeting sort of ace 8 and then ace 6 through ace 4. Sorry, ace six through ace three. So you're not targeting a large amount of his range, and to be honest, I'd be very surprised if he fold it just due to what you're representing if he's thinking on that level. And I don't expect him to fold pairs ever here. So it's just a case of looking at the hands that you're targeting. If we had a much worse flush draw, so we had Jack of Diamonds ten of spades here. We're not going to be able to show this hand down. So I'm much happier in that situation semi-bluffing. Of course, we'd have a gut shot as well. But um, I'm much happier bluffing there because we don't mind if anything folds. Because we just take the pot down there and then. However, in this situation, I actually wouldn't mind. If you think your opponent's going to barrel an awful lot or is extremely predictable, I wouldn't mind taking a hand like King Jack to show down here just due to the fact that if your opponent is a tight predictable tag he's not going to value bet ace high on the river so you're going to be in a situation where if he bets the river his hand is basically trip sevens a nine or nothing it may occasionally be a pocket pair so you might even consider calling down there so what you're essentially doing is turning a hand which could have showdown value in it into a bluff um, and I really don't particularly like the idea of doing that, especially when you have to write off a quarter of the combinations that you're going to get the guy to fold immediately just because he may have a flush draw that's better than yours. Um, I just honestly don't think this is going to work enough, and I think that it's a case where right idea in that this is the type of player that you probably do want to take shots at on the turn etc but probably poor in execution because of the exact hand that you've chosen to do it with so not going to uh, bash cash for me for having to go um, with a bluff here but I think that there's probably better opportunities out there than this sort of situation Still, I'm going to wrap up there with these six hands. I hope that you guys have enjoyed it. Just to plug one thing before I uh, finish, I currently have an offer on that is extending throughout all of November, and I might extend it into December, where I am actually offering a free video review um, for people who submit their videos to me. There is a interest registering thread 
uh, in the forum. I will post the link in the video thread. Let me know if you're interested in that. And uh, all the details are in there. So let me know if you're interested. And uh, thanks very much for watching this first video of this hand judging series, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. And I look forward to your comments. See you later.